Okay, so let's talk about the thyroid gland now. The thyroid gland is an endocrine gland situated in the lower part of the front and sides of the neck and produces two hormones, T3 and T4. It also produces calcitonin and is the only endocrine gland located superficially depending on external environment for raw materials such as iodine to synthesize hormones. Now coming to its location, this gland lies against the vertebrae C5, C6, C7 and T1 clasping the upper part of the trachea. It consists of right and left lobes anterolateral to the larynx and trachea and a relatively thin isthmus unites the lobes over the trachea and the isthmus may be incomplete. So, so far we have seen that the thyroid gland, it is a superficial endocrine gland and it is located against C5, C6, C7 and T1 vertebrae and clasp the upper part of the trachea. Okay, it's made up of two lobes which are the right and the left lobe. They are pyramidal in shape and they are connected by a narrow isthmus in the middle. Now let's look at the extent of each lobe. Now the lobes extend from the middle of the thyroid cartilage up to the fourth or the fifth tracheal ring. And the isthmus extends from the second to the third tracheal ring. Okay, in about 50% of the thyroid glands, there is the presence of a pyramidal lobe which extends from the isthmus superiorly upwards. In this image, I want to show you a transverse uh, section of the neck, okay? So if we cut the neck like this, like this, we would see that this is the anterior surface, this is the posterior surface, and here we have the trachea. This is the vertebrae. So the thyroid gland lies anterolaterally to the trachea. Now, some as I told you, it's consisting of two lobes and a pyramidal lobe. Now, sometimes what happens is there's a fibromuscular band or the levator of thyroid gland which descends downwards from the hyoid to the isthmus. Okay, and this could represent persisting distal end of the thyroglossal duct. Also, sometimes there is presence of accessory thyroid glands which are found in the vicinity of the lobes or above the isthmus and also in relation to the thyrohyoid. Now, these structures should be examined accurately in order to not leave behind any residual thyroid tissue during thyroidectomy. Now, coming to a very important topic, which is the capsule of the thyroid gland. Now, the thyroid gland is formed of two capsules, okay? There's an inner true capsule and an outer false capsule. So the inner true capsule is formed the true inner capsule is formed by the peripheral condensation of the fibrous stroma of the gland itself okay so it's peripheral condensation of the fibrous stroma of the gland and the false capsule is formed by the pretracheal fascia so we know that the neck is surrounded by the deep cervic cervical fascia like a collar and it sends certain extensions inwards which enclose the different compartments. So the pretracheal fascia encloses the larynx and the trachea and also forms a false capsule for the thyroid gland. Okay, so this is when we are seeing the uh, thyroid gland laterally. Okay, let me show you in this picture. We see this is the thyroid gland, right? And posteriorly it is looked related to the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage and the tracheal rings. So if I were to see it from this side, this is what I would see. Now one of the important things about this is that the pretracheal layer is thin along the posterior border of the lobes but thick on the inner surface of the gland where it forms a suspensory ligament of peri. Okay, this thickening of the pretracheal fascia as it's coming downward connects the gland to the cricoid cartilage and prevents the falling of the thyroid gland into the mediastinum okay this is why it's called the suspensory ligament of belly because it suspends it against the cricoid cartilage now what happens during deglutition is because the pretracheal fascia and the cartilages move upward the thyroid cartilage along with the suspensory ligament also moves up and down during deglutition Okay, this is an important 
differentiating factor in cervical tumors and enlargement of the thyroid gland. Okay, now in this diagram, you can see one more thing that is beneath the false capsule is the true capsule, and beneath the true capsule is a rich cap uh, venous plexus. Okay, this. so let's read about that. If I cut this, if I were to cut it like this and view it so, I would see the same thing the false capsule, true capsule, and beneath that is the venous plexus. So the venous plexus is present deep to the true capsule and to avoid hemorrhage during operation or thyroidectomy, the thyroid gland is removed along with the true capsule. So we would cut along this surface, right? We would take out the true capsule as well to prevent hemorrhage and further complications. Now let's compare this with the prostrate gland. See, in the prostrate gland, the venous plexus is present between the false capsule and the true capsule. Okay, so when we remove the gland, we can leave behind both the capsules. Because the venous plexus is present between the true and the false capsule. So this is an important five -hour question. Coming to the relation of the lobes. Now, lobes. now first of all, you must remember that the lobes that form the thyroid gland a conical in shape having an apex and a base and they're located anterolaterally okay so this brings us to two borders and three surfaces we'll discuss this in the next video